just chatting, uh -huh. right? I was telling you that of, of several of the powwow attendees that we've interviewed, uh, I was getting this little message that there seems to be uh, a shift of uh, interest towards U.S. national heritage, arts, and even the natural parks. Yeah. Uh, a shift from, say, past 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? Uh, I definitely have. I've been to Pow Wow 16 years now in a row. I've noticed that more and more people are coming to us and saying we let, want to do something unusual, something unique to America, something that is memorable. Uh, if it's their first time visiting a national park in the United States, they'll go to the Yosemite, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone. But if they're coming back, maybe they'll go to Joshua Tree outside Palm Springs or Channel Islands outside Los Angeles, Redwood in Northern California. And it, heritage and ecotourism is what we're calling it. Heritage tourism in the sense of they want to understand the roots of America, how it developed as a country, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, we have Ellis Island where the immigrants came through the Statue of Liberty. They've seen some of the biggest visitation in their history to Ellis Island. Really? We have the Statue of Liberty. Alcatraz, uh, man's inhumanity to mankind, kind of just the opposite. Manzanar, one of the internment camps for Japanese Americans were interred during World War II. So, um, and we talk about it. We don't um, mince words. And we don't package things like a lot of tourism attractions do. People can explore on their own. They can take audio tours. They can go on ranger walks. We offer a lot of different activities. Um, oh, boy. Where do we, where do we start and, and uh, talk a little further about? Let's, let's talk about uh, heritage and cultural rather than, and than the natural okay. a little bit. In the sense of heritage tourism, what we've done is in, we, there's national parks in 49 states and the District of Columbia. We've set up heritage itineraries. So if you're interested in uh, the Underground Railroad, you can go on one of our itineraries and learn what states it was in. You can go from park to park to park throughout those states. If you're interested in World War II, we have itineraries on nothing but World War II history and how it developed throughout the western United States. It can be as far away as Pearl Harbor. It can be in San Francisco, Rosie the Riveter. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We have heritage tourism tours that are Native American based in the southern United States and you can go around to the different national parks. And it works in really good with curriculum for schools. So a lot of parents go online, get the itinerary, and if their uh, child is, let's say, studying World War II, they can go to the World War II sites on their vacation, and it becomes a really educational experience. Now, um, there's, there's been a lot of um, regulations that limit motor coaches going into certain of our national parks mm -hmm. in, in, and uh, not, not to impede right. access, but to protect uh, our national parks. How has that worked now? And I think that started maybe 10 years ago. Right. Give, give me a little update on, on how's that working? Uh, has what are the benefits or, or challenges that's, uh, yeah. that's created? Well, with the motor coach industry, I myself have worked directly with the American Bus Association, for example. And where our, our interest in the National Park Service is to use sustainable transportation. We would much rather have a bus of 50 people drive into a park than one or two people in a dozen or more cars. Well, what we need to do is make sure our road structure, the infrastructure of our roads is good, that there's parking lots, the restrooms are adequate, and the visitor centers are adequate. I'm on the tourism board for the National Park Service. We're rewriting the tourism policy for the Park Service, and what we want to do is reach out to the industry, work with them. Uh, we're doing that in the Bay Area in San Francisco where I'm stationed, and it's actually been pretty successful. We worked with them to develop a new visitor center and develop the flow and circulation for the parking lot because buses take a lot larger turning radius and our visitor center and parking lot are going to be designed differently because of buses. And the industry likes that and then has come to us and said, gee, we want to volunteer and help restore some of the parks. And so we've had areas in our park where volunteers from the tourism industry have come and helped restore some of the areas. So they give back to the parks. And ideally, that's what we'd like to do on a national basis. And uh, of course, the majority of, of visitors are coming in their private cars. Correct. And uh, where are we now and how that works? And where, where do you think it's going to be five years from now? Or how, how you deal with parking yeah. and, and getting them around the yeah. national parks or the attractions? Yeah. 
what we're seeing is areas of high concentration of vehicles in national parks. We're looking at alternative modes of transportation, the South Rim of the Grand Canyon, Muir Woods National Monument, Zion, uh, up at the Arcadia during, at the, in the carriage roads, things like that. So we're looking at how people get out of their private cars and basically jump on a sustainable bus. And we're starting to look at and, and we're starting to use alternative fuel transportation like liquid natural gas in our transportation system so that they're clean burning and they move efficiency wise a large group of people. Our shuttle system at Mirror Woods that we piloted two years ago on weekends has gotten so successful we're expanding it this year and we're hoping to go seven days a week within five years. We've done a major transportation study. Mirror Woods is just one example of that, but um, Alcatraz, we're going to cleaner vessels. 90% cleaner boats are going to Alcatraz. Our concessionaire has ordered a solar sailor, which is a wind and solar powered boat. So in all of our new transportation contracts, we're requiring alternative fuel vehicles, sustainable transportation. And if it's traditional like diesel, we're requiring clean burning diesel engines in our transportation systems. And we're pretty happy with what's happened in the last couple of years. Travel Mall works uh, very closely with the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Group in yeah. Paris. And one of the, a couple of things, uh, challenges that they uh, relate uh, to us. Um, one, of course, is just um, uh, lack of trained managers to manage World Heritage Sites. Yeah. Uh, is that something, uh, an issue, a challenge we have in America? I don't, I don't think so, do we? Um, my perception is we have really good trained managers in North America, and especially the United States and Canada, and more so Mexico. I know that in San Francisco, we're receiving, uh, within the last two years, the highest concentration of international park officials coming to see what we're doing than we've ever seen before. And it's been Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Scotland, France, Germany, Japan, literally uh, almost every major country has been, is coming into the Bay Area to look at how we're developing ecotourism, clean transportation systems, healthy food in our parks, park partners, so it's not just the federal government doing everything, but uh, the federal government partnering with other organizations. I just went over to Ireland myself as a consultant for a nonprofit group to create an island prison national park called Spike Island that was going to be developed into a new prison. The culture of it, the history goes back 500 years. They're going to demolish everything, build a bridge to it and put a new prison on it. Because of a conference I was at and a number of speakers including myself, yesterday the, the cultural heritage tourism official for Ireland said we're no longer going to do that, we're going to open it as a world heritage site, as a national preserve and it's going to be protected based on what we did with Alcatraz. So they're using Alcatraz as a model to begin, be, bring tourism into Cove, Ireland. So it's pretty exciting. What, what is the path when you talk about, let's say, training or education? If mm -hmm. I want to uh, become um, uh, trained and, and being capable, have the facilities to manage a, natu uh, 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 a natural park, mm -hmm or heritage site, Yeah. what do I need to do to, to, to gain those skills? In the United States, there's probably a good dozen universities that teach park and recreation management courses, like the University of Montana at Missoula, Chico State in Northern California, Humboldt State in Northern California, uh, Northern Arizona University, etc. And they have park and recreation management courses that basically, and you can specialize, you can go into more natural areas management, cultural areas management, or in a lot of our larger parks, you have to have both background. And even more so nowadays, you have to have a business background. You have to be managing multi-million dollar budgets in national parks. You've got to go into your local gateway community and sit down at the table and say, here's what I'm proposing. It's going to be significant changes for the gateway community. We need you to work with us and I'm going to put together a business plan that will increase tourism at the same time protect our natural and cultural resources. And uh, we're working to learn how to do carrying capacity studies so we know how to protect the resource but have a good visitor experience. I've uh, participated in some of those and we're bringing in universities like the University of Vermont to help us do those studies. So we're training a whole new generation, hopefully, of park service people in the modeling of uh, carrying capacity issues and business plans. National parks now, a lot of them have business plans, and we're bringing in business schools to do that. So you need a business background, and you need a human research background, a natural research background, and a cultural background. So quite a few different things. Um, 
some uh, World Heritage sites and um, or just other uh, uh, you know natural or cultural sites. I've, I've heard of some challenges they would uh, encounter with private enterprise mm -hmm. uh, projects. I'll give a couple examples. Yeah. Someone would tell me, hey, we have this World Heritage Site in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. We just learned uh, the other day that there's this hotel development group that wants to create this lodge next to the our World Heritage Site. Yeah. Or you probably have read about the in um, in Africa by Victoria Falls, Livingston mm -hmm. City, some developer wants to build this resort yeah. right in the middle of this elephant trail, yeah. you know, uh, uh, trail, and uh, boom, uh, there's all of a sudden, it's like they're locking horns. Yeah. Um, do, number one question is, do we have that kind of situation here mm -hmm. besides people with snowmobiles yeah. going through yeah. our parks? What? Give us a couple examples. Of we do. We have private development, especially in the eastern United States, up against areas like Gettysburg National Battlefield. And we have uh, the competing interests of increasing visitation and tourism by building strip malls and hotels and things on property that Civil War people died on adjacent to the Civil War site. So that when you're standing on hollow ground like at Gettysburg and other places, you will see a mall. And what we're doing is working with the local community and saying, this is short-sighted tourism. Let's work together. Let's develop a master plan for the area that goes way beyond the park so that we can help increase visitation, help increase your local economy, but at the same time turn around and make it a sustainable type of development that it won't hurt the visitor experience. Because if you hurt the visitor experience to a place like Gettysburg and people all of a sudden don't come, you won't need that hotel or that strip mall or whatever. Is, is that working? Is that so far? It is working. They're uh, listening. They're yeah. finding solutions. Yeah. They can make the same amount that of everybody money can work or more together. money than they yeah. originally planned. And that nonprofits can come in and help run some of the facilities, like bookstores and educational things, and extend the reach of a national park so it doesn't end the minute you leave a park. That your experience continues out in the community. So that there's a film on Gettysburg that shows in a facility that's not owned by the Park Service, and it's an excellent film as an example. Uh, we've had a lot of, over the history of the Park Service, now 90 years, we've had a lot of impacts from private development adjacent to our property. The more we work with the community and try to make it so that everybody understands what benefits the park and the community together is a benefit for everybody. Speaking of communities, do I have this right? We have the U.S. Natural, National Park Service. Yeah. But the Indian reservations mm -hmm. are outside of the Park Service, but they're very often adjacent to national parks. Yeah. Right? And they're and they're managed by another They're managed division. they're managed by another federal agency, but under the Department of Interior. So we have Department of Interior National Park Service and we have the Bureau of Indian Affairs, both reporting to the Secretary of Interior, who is uh, Kemp Thorne. And so we actually have a very good dialogue because we're under an umbrella uh, community in the sense of the Department of Interior. So we communicate actually in most parks pretty well. Our relationship with the tribes around the Bay Area is so good that we've contracted with them through Native American filmmakers to make movies for us. They've then produced books for us and we've had them at some of our ceremonies where we've actually reclaimed some of the land for wetlands and they've done some um, some ceremonial dances and uh, speeches for us. It's been pretty phenomenal. They've also donated uh, artifacts in some of the parks. You know, um, a lot of times there's criticism against the government for having taken artifacts from the Native Americans and putting them in museums and nobody sees them. Well, we're doing just the opposite in San Francisco. They are so happy in working with us on Alcatraz and Chrissy and other places. They're actually donating some of the artifacts to us to put on display for the public. What What is the story behind... Um the Grand Canyon, I think it's West Grand Canyon, Skywalk. Mm -hmm. Skywalk is in the Havasu Indian Tribe, and that's separate of the National Park right. Service. Separate jurisdiction. Um, but still under the Ministry, uh, our Department of Interior. Well, the tribes report to the Department of Interior in a sense of Native American treaty rights and things like that. Well, but let me it's, get, let me it's get sovereign to nation my land, question though. is this. Mm -hmm. I understand that they felt compelled because... They just don't have enough revenue coming in or right. jobs for their roughly 2,000 tribe members to make a proper living. Yeah. And some entrepreneur comes around, David, yeah. and said, let's 
let's do this uh, skywalk. Yeah. And they do a skywalk. Yeah. You say it's the proof in the is in the pudding. In yeah. The future of how the skywalk works. In the sense of attracting tourism, it certainly made a statement that that tribe needed to have an economy that would be self-sustaining and um, through traditional means like. Um, selling artifacts and things like that. It, it's a long way off the beaten path. They weren't probably able to go that direction. It isn't a place a casino w would seem to would seem to work either. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we understand why they did it. It is um, close to the park. It is not on Park Service property, and it's away from most of the view shed of the park. So impacts to the park itself will probably be fairly minimal. But anytime there's development in and around and adjacent to a national park area, it is a concern to yeah, the that's park why service. I, ask, yeah. I think if you were to ask the traditional park service person, they would be disappointed that that's there, because it has significantly impacted the viewshed from a lot of the rest of the Grand Canyon, which doesn't end where the park's boundary ends by any means. So, for some, disappointing. Great answer. But the traditional park, uh, yeah, person. Yeah. But but, but for a non-traditional park person, how how would one view it? Uh, one would look at it as a, a potential revenue source and a sustainable, tourism is sustainable, and if it can be done without damaging the environment, it potentially could be a win with everybody. I haven't seen it myself. I personally hope there's some educational value to it, that it's not just the skywalk, that it talks about the geology, the human history and such. I think the more that you can uh, educate, the better you're going to be in the long run. To me, education is sustainability, too, and I'm just hoping that they take advantage of the million plus people a year that are projected to go out there. Yeah, they're telling me uh, 4,000 people the first day, averaging yeah. 2,000 since. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you so very oh, much. Thank